Welcome, everyone, to my first podcast ever. It's called Clicking Buttons, and it's going to be about anything that has to do with online poker. So if you're interested in online poker, you're at the right spot. Today, we're going to be interviewing a fellow poker player, a streamer, the man I've dubbed the Michigan Ivy because of how well he's doing over on those Ivy, uh, sorry, the Michigan websites. Uh, David Cape, welcome, David, to the podcast. How are you doing today? Doing great. How about yourself? Great, great. Yeah. So I'm excited. This is my first podcast, so you are going to be the inaugural uh, guest. And uh, as you know, you know we've we've uh, hosted each other back and forth on Twitch a bunch. I uh, initially found you on Twitch. Um, I don't know if you were streaming before me or I was streaming before you, but I remember seeing your channel and thinking, wow. This is kind of like what I am trying to go for myself, a very like well thought out online poker player who I can watch and isn't going to be crazy emotional one way or another, but, um, you know, making really good plays and uh, had really good uh, thoughtful analysis. So, yeah, welcome to the stream. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate the kind words. And I would say that the same thing, likewise, I've really been a big fan of your channel. I'm always happy to send the raids back and forth. I think a lot of the audience, you know, if they enjoy one stream, they're going to enjoy the other. Uh, especially, you know, cash games aren't necessarily always as popular as tournaments, but, you know, cash games is growing on Twitch. Right. It's definitely going to see. Yeah, we got to we gotta rep the uh, cash game streets because those MTT streamers, they're, you know, they got, they already have all of the excitement built in, right? They already have all the big scores and the final tables and the drama, but... Um... Yeah, cash games is a little less exciting sometimes, but in the same sense, it's also, I think, more of a consistency of, you know, a strategy that you can watch and it's always exciting. Um, whereas, you know, as an MTT or you could probably just play a hand and bust the MTT immediately and you'd be you'd be out of content. Um, yeah, unless you fired yeah. up the next one. Exactly. Just a different sort of type of fun, I think. But yeah, definitely nice to have both of them being showcased on Twitch these days. Yeah. So uh, let's get started with uh, just how you got into online poker, because I think everyone has a different, uh, you know, introduction to online poker. Um, you've, you know, established yourself as an online player and as a content creator. So how did you specifically get into online poker? Yeah, so it started like a lot of people um, when I graduated from high school and was going on to college or as many people call it university. So this is the summer of 2010. Started playing some $5 home games with some friends, a bunch of my high school buddies. And then as I was going off to college, we obviously wasn't going to have that home game as much anymore as I was moving away. But I uh, found online poker, uh, so really kind of fell in love with the game, the competitive nature of it. I was really into basketball growing up, so just being able to transition from like one competitive aspect to another was appealing. Um, and also the cool thing, you can make a little bit of money at it. You know, even if it was like a $5 home game, the excitement and rush of winning $25 was cool, especially with the bragging rights over friends. So... Transition to playing a little bit of online for about three years, I think, my first three years of college. Just small uh, and micro-stake MTTs, probably talking up to like $33 buy-ins, nothing too crazy. Uh, just playing as much as I can, but still going to college at the same time. Transitioned a little bit to live poker, probably the second half of my junior year once I turned 21. Playing some live 1-2 cash games, nothing too crazy, while I continue to play small stakes, micro-stake MTTs. Uh, graduate college after four years and then took about a year and a half off from playing poker. I think it's just a lot of like transitioning to the real world. At this point, no real aspirations to play for a living, whether it be live or online. And then living in the United States, your online options were super limited at this time. So this is going to be like 2014, 2015. And then about 2016, started getting back into poker again, but with online options still pretty limited. Uh, started playing live poker again and then undeservingly binked like a $400 tournament. I had no business playing for about 15.9k just like a local event which then gave me like the bankroll to really play like some live one two and two five in michigan uh just continued doing that playing pretty little online like i said it's not tons of online options at the time so this is like 2016 until march of 2020 when the pandemic started shutting things down quite a bit and then that's when like i would say like the second half of my online poker journey started is now i couldn't play online i had more free time um so i kind of just like dove into the game a bit and i remember when i first got back into playing online in the first week or two, I'm trying to play 200 NL just because I figure, oh, I played 1-2 live or 2-5 live, 1-2 is going to be fine. And then quickly realize I have no business being in these <laughs> games. I don't even know pre-flop ranges well enough. Um, the 2-5 games I was playing in before, it's like if somebody threw about you, they have Queens plus, maybe just Aces and Kings. So obviously a huge adjustment. So pretty quickly, I like dive in realizing like if I'm 
this to play online. I need to join like a training site, so I join a training course, do a lot of study, drop all the way down to 10 NL. So basically at that point, even though my bankroll is higher, it was from playing live. It wasn't proving it online. So I kind of wanted to prove myself and go through the stake levels uh, to make sure I could actually, you know, beat the games uh, that I was right. playing in. So that was a really fun process. Like I really enjoyed, like I, it was at this point I was studying more than I ever had really working on my game, getting a much better like theory-based game, obviously cranking out lots more hands than I ever had. Um, and then at this point, like I was having fun, but I still kind of missed like the human interaction alive. So that's probably like two or three months later, I kind of got into watching more Twitch streams, which then I was enjoying more because I felt like I was part of a community, even though I was a lurker. So shout out to lurkers. I've been one for a long time on Twitch. I uh, wasn't necessarily like super involved in the chat, but just like watching people playing in games similar to how I was made it more fun. So eventually I decided to fire up my own Twitch stream as well. And uh, yeah, so like the online journey has kind of been a mix of like the content creation slash the playing. So I started streaming in July of 2020, I believe. Also, so when I started my YouTube channel. At this point, like no real plans to be playing professionally. I still have like full-time job um, outside of poker. Just, you know, again, a lot of free time because of all the lockdowns that were going on. Kind of like I looked at it as like a project to take on. Um, and then... At the same time, there was a lot of potential I saw in the United States because we were going to be going from, in the, specifically the state I live in, we were going to get these fenced-in state-regulated player pools probably within 12 months. So, you know, I kind of just started getting into that to try to be ready for that. And, yeah, just been grinding mainly cash games since then. I do dabble in some tournaments. Michigan would eventually launch in, like, I think it was January or February of 2021. So we've had it for about a year and a half now. And then just, like, the poker and stuff started taking off, both poker and content. And eventually it made the dive in uh, September of last year, so just about a year ago, switching to doing poker and content creation with the streaming and YouTube stuff full time. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I'm very impressed with your uh, memory recall with all those dates. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, when I was doing uh, that poker journey thing on YouTube, I did it like I had to literally go back and look at receipts of when I started things because I couldn't remember anything. But yeah, uh, yeah wow, that's a uh, that's a great journey. Um, you mentioned that you had a four-year degree. Uh, what what was that in? Yeah, so I majored in business management. So like when I was in college, like I said, poker was never like doing full-time poker. If you would have told me I'd be doing that later in life, I would have said there's no way. Right. I love the game. It just wasn't the avenue that I thought I was going to be going. Uh, but still wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. So I felt like business management, even though you're probably better off specializing a little bit more than that, I was like this is probably broad enough where I can get into like you know the corporate world. And just like, you know, have the degree. And then as I learn more in the future, like kind of just branch out from there and kind of figure out exactly what I want to do. Right. Do you, do you think that business management kind of helped you with your content creation aspect or even the poker playing aspect of things? So as far as the content, I wouldn't say the management did as much as I still took marketing classes, which I think were actually been super helpful. So just like kind of thinking of things in terms of like, okay, how do I grow my channel? So I know one big thing I did that um, I think was really helpful is I launched a YouTube channel uh, because on Twitch, it's like super hard to get off the bottom of the directory if you don't have any name recognition in poker. So for anybody right. else or started streaming, I'm just some random guy from Michigan, right, yeah. streaming. Uh, so I think like I did some hand analysis of the Doug Polk Danny Negroni match, which people seem to like because it's not a topic people are interested in, which then, you know, kind of just led to the YouTube videos, getting more views, which I did a lot of Twitch highlights, so then people would find the Twitch channel. So I think like, not necessarily the management stuff I had uh, for my major, but I think like having those marketing classes was pretty helpful and kind of gets my mind like ticking in that direction, which right. was definitely like really big when I was first starting out. Okay. So like when you, when you did first start out, um, what did you kind of want out of online poker? Was it more of just a hobby or did you kind of see it as like, maybe I could actually make a run at this, you know, uh, what was your ambition there for starting to play online? Yeah, so when I started playing online when I was 18, it was more or less just like for a fun competitive hobby. Um, I just, I've been competing my whole life, mainly with sports, but also video games. Like my friends and I, we were huge on like the football and basketball games. Okay. We would run, we, we would run like five and $10 tournaments as kids on the weekend. Um, super serious, very competitive. So it was kind of like a nice competitive outreach. And then also it's just because anytime you do anything with money, like people get very competitive, right? So even people that aren't usually very competitive, even if it's just like five or ten dollars, they really yeah. want to win. So I <laughs> love that aspect of it. And then getting into online, it was just the ability to play from anywhere. Like I was at school, I could play in my dorm room, um, and you could play. You know, these tournaments that are like five dollar buy-ins with two thousand people with lots of money up top. You know, at the time, especially, 
Um, and that was like exciting and appealing and like kind of going for that tournament rush. I uh, was still a tournament guy at the time. I've, I've come around these days to mainly a cash game player, but uh, the tournaments and the online stuff like definitely got me started in the game. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, a lot of people get attracted by those tournaments. You know, the high, like I was saying earlier, the high reward um, hey. is very attractive. Yeah, that's an, that's interesting. I can I can definitely relate to like the video game aspects. I think a lot of online poker players have some kind of background in video games, um, because most traditional poker players, you know, they're not gonna just like, uh, first of all, be on a PC a lot, right? Maybe a lot of them are going into the casino and they're never even gonna hear about what Poker Stars is or anything like that. So like just yeah. being on the PC playing video games or being kind of uh, in that realm i think helps transition into online uh, a lot easier than uh some other people might have um which uh which games do you think we were uh specialized in for the uh the sports games was it madden or fifa yeah, or... yeah it was the american football game so it'd be madden and then back in the day when that ncaa football that was my favorite nice. uh, they only ran that to like 2013 and 2014 but apparently it's coming back next year so i'm sure i'll go on like a two-week binge of like nostalgia throwback of playing some college football uh video games but those are like my two games of choice in the games i was best at right so going forward you've you've had now you've had a lot of success in the last couple of years playing online um would you say you were a professional poker player or more of a content creator now or maybe a hybrid yeah this is always a really tough question so i think if i'm you know being fair and like looking at, i would definitely say like a poker like a content creator uh, streamer so I definitely but I also think like being taking aspects of what poker pros do is a huge part of it so I'm a huge believer at the end of the day like if what's important to me is getting my stream to be good to watch like a huge part of that is me being better at the game right so if I'm playing say in my player pool 500 NL and beating that that's going to really help the stream as opposed to 50 NL and also just going back to the competitive background is I don't like to lose so right. you know, it's just competitively you want to be really good um, but I think a lot of it, you know, I, I would usually say like poker streamer, content creator, uh, because I do think like long-term that's the biggest thing. Um, but again, you, to, in order to have a good poker stream and content is like, you have to be good at the game right now. Good's always relative. Uh, but I try to look at it as like, try to be the best player I can. So bringing, you know, value to the viewers and then also bringing excitement, um, both of, like both of those things together. Yeah. That is, that's always the trick, right? Trying to balance, you know, what's good for content, what's your poker goal, um, but it does help when you have that alignment where it's like, okay, if I get better at poker, I will also get more viewers. I will also, you know, attract more people to watch my stream. Um, I think I've had that experience a lot as well, just trying to grow and balance, you know, not just taking high stakes shots because I know people are going to want to see, you know, people yeah. take high stakes shots. Um, the cash game, I've noticed the cash game category has kind of grown in Twitch. Uh, fairly recently. So I think um, you have a lot of competition out there. And like you said, you're a very competitive person. You know, yeah. are you are, are you ever like looking at the lobby? Like, hey, like how many viewers does this person have? Am I gonna, you know, surpass this person? What do I have to do to like stand out? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, I'd be lying if I said it's not like, you know, looking through the directory and trying to do the best you can with it. Um, I think at the end of the day, like, it's just like, you know, content's kind of the same as poker is and poker, like, you need to be aware of what's going around you, but like at the end of the day, as long as you're putting the work in and like doing the best you can to say in this situation, grow your channel, like that's what will bring it. So it's more about the process rather than the results, which is an easy correlation for a poker player, right? It's not about how good or bad you ran on a certain day. It's like, did I play well or not? Right. Um, so I think kind of the same thing with the stream. It's like, if I stream today, it's not necessarily how many viewers I had today, right? There's a lot of variables that play a factor in it, but it's like, did I bring good energy? You know, was I awake and ready to go? Was I explaining my thought process well? Uh, things like that. Yeah, so that kind of leads me to my uh, next question about like, what does your grind look like? Um, are you, do you have like a set schedule for playing online poker? You know, um, do you have certain rituals that you do to warm up? Like what's your, like walk me through what your, you know, I'm gonna play online poker today. What's your, what's your day look like there? Yeah, so it's pretty uh, pretty scheduled out for the week. I think I'm, and I feel like you might be similar to this because I know you're pretty scheduled on the times you stream. I'm a very scheduled and structured out person. That's how I operate best. Whereas I feel like a lot of poker players really like the freedom of kind of going as it goes. Yeah. But uh, I've definitely found myself, I'm much better in structure. So I uh, kind of just like starting off the week, I try to stream quite a bit. I do uh, locally, it's about 12 to 5 or 12 to 6, to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
four to five days a week, Monday through Friday. Dabble in some tournaments on Sundays, not as much lately, but we'll do that from time to time. So if it's like a day that I'm streaming, I usually wake up about 8 a.m., which again, a little bit different for a lot of poker players. Um, 7 30, 8 a.m., depending if I'm trying to get out. Um, I'm trying to be pretty good about getting 10,000 steps every day walking. Like it sounds okay. like a little thing, but it's, you know, it's just good to make sure I get outside and moving. Um, and then just at least some activity, you know. I used to be super active before the pandemic, and it's definitely ticked down a lot, but at least keep that going. Uh, so I'll get the walk in, and then a lot of times it just depends on the YouTube editing. So I have a YouTube channel. I spend about eight to 10 hours a week editing videos. So a lot of times I'll do that in the morning before I stream, or it might be at night. It just kind of depends how the days line up and what my schedule looks like outside of playing. Uh, but I would say most days I try to do it in the morning. So it's like I get up 7.30, do some walking, uh, then jump into some video editing, and then usually grab lunch and then get ready. Probably about like 11.40ish. I probably don't have as like great of a routine as you know everybody should before jumping on. Answer some YouTube comments because I post my videos at 11 a.m. So I try to answer some of those first comments and then kind of just jump into the grind. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned um, fitness with online poker. You used to be really active, and yeah. now obviously, like uh, you know, our our hobby slash careers are very sediment uh, sedentary. Like I. Mm. I've never sat in this chair more in my life since the pandemic. Um, yeah. And so it is kind of a struggle for me personally to have like a balance of fitness, but you said like you're trying to get in 10,000 steps and you know, yeah. that's, that sounds like a good goal. Um, do you just kind of take walks or run the treadmill or something like that before you start streaming? Yeah, I do a lot of like outdoor walking or if I'm working out and lifting, which again, trying to get better with, I was, it's, it was tough because I was so good for probably about a five or six year stretch right before the pandemic. And then I just like fell off routine. Um, so, you know, as sporadically trying to get back into the workouts, a lot of times if I'm working out, at least get on the elliptical. Um, I noticed like from running, I played basketball a lot growing up. So if I do a lot of running on treadmill, my knees, I can feel a little bit, which is not good to say when you're only 30 years old, but I can I feel that. a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So the elliptical is a little bit more friendly for that. Uh, so I'll do that a lot of times if like I'm lifting or mainly just like going out for walks outside. Um, in Michigan here, it does get a bit cold. So, you know, in the winter, it's not quite as fun. But if you bundle up, you can usually make it work if you're used to the cold. Maybe some snowshoeing before. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So it's um, it is a, it is a struggle to balance online poker and fitness. You see a lot of like uh, you see very polarizing sides. Sometimes you see like uh, the the player who's probably never worked out in their life and they're just crushing it having no schedule just doing whatever they feel like jumping on playing poker and then you have more of the regimented like schedule based players and i think it's um you know in theory it 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 should be the scheduled like you know eat healthy live healthy but it is tough to it is tough to sustain that over long periods of time so i i understand that struggle i think everyone can kind of relate there with trying to find a balance in fitness and um and work especially if you're on the computer like at its core online poker players were were desk jockeys right we're just sitting at a desk 24 7 uh you know doing our work here and uh looking around me it's like you know i probably have taken 30 steps total today <laughs> yeah but, yeah it's good it's good that you uh you have that discipline to get in the fitness on top of everything um, so let's kind of talk more about the poker side of things. Um, as a, you know, I would say uh, relative to me, you're, you're more new in the poker scene. Um, you said 2016, you started to get a bit more serious about things. Was that right? Where, um, if I was saying being serious about it, I wouldn't say really until like March of 2020, once, right. uh, pandemic started shut down. It's like, I mean, I was playing like live one, two and two, five, but even then it's like, maybe three times a month it's so i wouldn't really say until the pandemic okay i would say especially for online got like super serious about it so yeah so like during this time you know it's kind of the age of the solver right it's the age of uh you know gto uh you know you play a hand this way and whatever the solver says that's right um on like a scale of exploitative to theoretical um kind of player where do you think you would fall on that scale yeah, I think I would definitely have to say I try to do GTO, emphasis on try, you know, no one's perfect with it. Um, but I think it definitely depends on the opponent type. I think that especially playing in a small player pool, which I'm sure we'll get into with playing in Michigan, is you play against a lot of the same people a lot. So against regs, I'm definitely going to be a lot more like try to be theory based. Uh, but against a lot of like the more casual players, 
it's insane when you play with the same casual players so often, like just certain tells you can pick up on. So something as simple as like, they bet this size, they have it. They bet right. this size, they don't. And it sounds insane, but it, sometimes it really can be that simple if you play with them enough and like look through your databases and stuff and talk hands with people. Uh, so I would definitely say a bit more exploitive. Uh, still like when playing against more rec players, it's probably exploitive in the sense of sizings maybe a bit. Um, so just kind of going outside what would be my normal rules say. Right. Um, especially, you know, with streaming, I'm sure you run across this too, is like, you have to be even more careful um, with being balanced because it's like, if you're doing something and you yeah. know someone wants your stream, like you can really get abused for it. So I think especially versus like regs, I try to be as close to theory as I understand it. Um, but then I still probably have some exploits more or less against the more casual players. Yeah, I think that's that's a big... Uh, it's, it's, it's fair to say that, you know, as a streamer, we have to be very careful because every time I stream, I always see, you know, the regs that are playing in my pool come in and, like, say, oh, like, yeah, nice hand there, or, like, I had this there or that, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess you are watching every move I make right now. Exactly. So it's uh it's it's a challenge to balance, you know, deviating from what is optimum play and um what is, you know, exploitative. Um I think that also you coming in more serious after there's already been a really established uh you know GTO kind of atmosphere with all of the sites, all the solvers and everything like that, it's more accessible. Uh, for you to learn so like if you wanted to kind of casually learn it it would be a lot easier than if like you started playing in 2013 2014 when like we didn't even have solvers <laughs> um and that was a different dynamic right too because uh i think you mentioned uh the way you study reminds me of how i used to study um mm -hmm. i used to try and find the smartest group of people i could find and just pick their brain and go back and forth and talk about things um so you're you're doing some of that as well correct yeah so i would say a big part of my study is like admittedly i'm not in the solver very much at all like i have gto plus i don't go plugging in hands a ton myself uh, i'm very fortunate that my best friend outside of poker just from real life that i've known since fifth grade is a um the, one of the crushers in michigan in the cash game scene uh plays up to like 2k and l online and he's just been him and others you know that i've gotten to know through him have just been like so willing to help and it's like even if I'm not running the hands myself, I got like a good foundation first by getting like joining a training site, getting a lot of that stuff. But as far as a lot more of like kind of getting to the next level is like, I will send them a hand, they will run it for me and basically just explain what they're doing. Um, weekly Zoom call, like, hey, here's some hands, let me know what you think. Uh, so I'm very fortunate in that sense is like, you know, I know we're mainly trying to focus on the poker part, but like going to the content piece, you know, when you're doing the content creation, I'm sure you run into this is like, there's still only so many hours in the day. So all the hours I'm editing YouTube videos, if I was just a strictly poker pro, I would be spending studying, right? So that's why I'm always trying to be very, like, admittedly, like, hey, I'm a content creator and poker player. Right. Uh, but fortunately for me, because I have, like, these great resources that are just, like, so willing to help, like, so unselfishly and so much appreciative of it, it makes my studying really efficient, where it's, like, and they're really good about, like, explaining, like, okay, it's not just this hand, what you should have done here, but, like, how do we play our range here, right? right. And then they explain, like, why the solver is, like, picking in this spot and then the range. So I think... That's even though I'm not the one plugging it in on a day to day basis, like, and that would be better in theory, right? If I'm in there going through all my spots immediately and everything, uh, just having people that know it pretty well and have worked with it for a few years, it's just like, it's so beneficial. And I still get a lot of the information and kind of like concepts that the solver tries to teach. And then I can still implement my game even if I'm not the one plugging it in on a day to day basis. Right. So you mentioned um, small pool versus large pool. You're playing in these Michigan games. Do you ever have these hands that come up where you're like, well, that was Bob. Bob is never bluffing. I am not calling this combo. And your study partner's like, you got to call this combo. It's a good blocker to have, you know? Like, Do you ever have exactly. those kind of conversations where, you know, yeah. you have those instances? Yeah, and it's always tough, too, because it's like, you know, you got to be very careful to kind of go back to the streaming thing of like, I, you know, you don't want to be like, hey, I'm never calling a single bluff if you know they might watch the stream because then I can change things. But it's it's definitely the hard part of it, too, with, um, like I said, player pool tendencies, and we've all been there. And it, it's hard, though, because you have to be really careful that you're just not making excuses for yourself if you do something right. that's all wrong. So it's like, you know, you can be like, oh, well, I know better than the solver. But you have to, what I usually tell people about like exploitive is like you have to understand what the solver is saying first to be exploitive, right? So like when we say Bob's not bluffing, well, what is he not bluffing that he should be, right? So mm -hmm. then therefore it's 
you're not going in node locking, obviously, all these, but it's the concept of node locking of, okay, here's what his range actually looks like. Here's what the solver would say the adjustments are. Right. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, you got to be very careful with that, but there's definitely times to deviate, particularly when you know a certain opponent like very well. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that. I think um, I have a bit of a different experience on the uh, the rest of the world uh, mm -hmm. sites where the pools are really large. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, you don't have Zoom poker, do you? You don't have the no, fast we fold? Have, like, yeah, we just have regular tables. I think technically MGM has like the fast forward because they use the party poker software, but I don't think it ever runs and it only goes up to like 25 or 50 ML anyways. Okay. Yeah, if if you had access to that, do you think you would want to play a Zoom or a fast fold game? Um, I think like the uh, the regular table. Yeah, I think they would go with the reg tables just from you know again I I don't have experience playing on like the dot com cash games with stars or party poker or anything like that. Uh, but just from what I gather, it's like your win rates are higher at reg tables. Now, obviously in Zoom, you're cranking out more hands, right? So just because your win rates lower in Zoom doesn't mean you're not making more money. Um, but I think instinctively, and especially too, because I've never been a person that's good at like mass multi-tabling. So like I only play like three to four tables at a time with rank tables. So like a huge advantage with like Zoom format, from what I understand, is cranking out tons of hands. But if I'm not even going to be doing that anyways, I think like for me specifically, I'm much better focusing on the rank tables probably long term. Right. So you mentioned three to four tables. Um, do you think that that would increase or or as to the same if you weren't streaming? Uh, if I wasn't streaming, I would say no way I go above six. Um, I would guess it's, I would say probably I would play like five or six instead of, I mostly play four. So I would say maybe you would add a table or two. Um, but obviously you don't know until you try it, but I would have to imagine I'd probably be somewhere in the five to six table for reg tables if I wasn't streaming. Yeah, I think like five or six would be equivalent to two Zoom mm -hmm. tables, maybe three. But I think it's fairly similar in that regard in terms of like clicking um would you yeah. do you tile cascade stack what's your uh what's your screen look like when you're playing four or five tables yeah i just have like i think tiles the right term i feel bad i don't even know it's just like straight across where i can see all of them right where they're like all just kind of like side by side um, exactly up and down yeah i, I think it would be nuts if i could do this if the stacking i see the videos of people doing it I don't yeah. know if I've ever done it, but i'm just like how do you it would drive me nuts it would actually make me go crazy i think in, in theory, I love the idea of stacking. When it comes to actually playing stacking, I feel like I'm constantly timing out hands. If I mm -hmm. like, if you like misclick a table or like you are trying to get back to a table, it's really difficult. So like you have to be really quick with all of your decisions. Like if you want to think about a spot and then you click another table, then that table can time out and not pop back up. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So like exactly. there's stacking is actually really hard to play unless you have a very quick play style. Um, mm -hmm. But it looks so cool. It looks so cool when you see people play it because they're just like, it looks like they're a, you know, a computer just like clicking through buttons, just perfectly playing. It's, it's, it's fun to look at, but um, yeah. in reality, I think tiling is what most online poker players would probably play. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think cascading is for, um, people that are unwell. <laughs> I think cascading, uh, I've never seen anyone actually like cascading the tables where it's like the stacking uh, from like the left corner down to the right corner. Yeah. Uh, but if you're going to cascade, I feel like, why don't you just stack? Um, but yeah, I don't well. know. I, I'd be curious. I, I'd really be curious to hear from people that cascade tables and stack tables and tile tables, because I think like your experience is actually different a lot from all of the nuances, right? Like just even where your eyes are on the table. Um, if you're, if anyone's watching me streaming, I'm constantly like looking left, right, left, right, left, right at the different tables. But if you're playing stacked, you're literally just zoned in in one spot like that. So I think your experience actually changes significantly. Um, and maybe it's for some people and maybe not for others. I don't know. Yeah, it could just be one of those things where it's like a personal preference, like where 95% of people, you know, one way works, but for the other 5%, they can pull it off and, you know, yeah. helps make the table. So I think I'm going to make a Twitter poll on that. That's, that. that's I think that's an interesting thing to see how many people are tiling versus stacking versus cascading. Um, so you mentioned that the games were tougher on the rest of world sites. Do you think that you would be competitive on those rest of world sites if you had access to stars? Um, or if you had access to the things, or it's kind of hard. I know it's a hard question to answer, but um, how do you feel about the level of play on Michigan versus maybe the rest of the world sites? 
Yeah, I mean, the truth is, I don't know. So, like, I'll just start with that caveat. It's like, I have no idea. I have never played cash games on, like, Stars.com, Party Poker, 888. Um, the only experience I have was when I was playing a little bit of the ACR Blitz, like, 10 and L, 50 and L. But, again, this is, like, when I first, you know, two years ago, was just learning ranges even for 6 max. So, right. um, I, played a, I would say, like, what I get told from a lot of people is, is that um, Ignition, so like if you're familiar with like Ignition Bovada, that those games are pretty similar to the Michigan games. And again, I'm just kind of going off the information I get from people. Whereas like games on like Stars, like for example, I know you played some Zoom, like 200, 500, like those games are significantly tougher at similar stake levels than say the games I'm playing in. Um, but again, it's just like, it's so hard for me to know because I'm just kind of going off other people's information. Right. So I, as far as the dot-com sites, it probably depends on the site. You know, yeah. how well you would if you'd even win and um, you know that kind of stuff it's hard to really say exactly yeah some of these questions were from some chat uh some chatters also that were just curious so mm -hmm. if i roll off some of those questions they could be from chat yeah. as well did they have uh, any questions about specific player pools i know there's like a lot of uh, certain ones people are always curious about um i think it was just rest of world stars versus okay. uh, what you're playing on now that was what the yeah. question was referring to um but talking about uh more in the general aspect of poker was there any like player that you admired when you were coming up or that like motivated you um and uh like what did they do that made you study them or change your game or looking back was the thing they did good from like a modern lens so you can break down that question with uh yeah, first off just did you admire anybody coming up yeah i think it was like the classics back in 2010 so i was like a fan of ivy negranu um, later on, Doug Polk, because, like, I just love his videos and content stuff. Um, but as far as, like, you know, watching, like, I think Ivy Negreanu, and this is, like, again, like, 2010, 2013 era, I was obsessed with watching the EPT reruns and highlight shows, the European Poker Tour with the star stuff. Right. Uh, WSOP coverage, I, when I was talking to you yesterday, I even mentioned, I was, like, once I, you know, got your real name, I was, like, oh, I'm almost positive I've seen your updates on the, uh, the mixed games, because I, again, I was just, like, a poker fanboy. Yeah. Uh, you know, just following all that kind of stuff. So I would say, like, you kind of, like, those guys at the top, and then as far as now, it's, like, weird to say, like, you admire, like you said, my best friend Dom, just kind of admire his work ethic and, like, how good he's gotten at the game, but it's obviously a different lens than, like, a poker celebrity kind of thing. So I'd say at first, like, obviously, like, the big names, Ivy and Negreanu, and then more of, like, you know, just kind of looking at my friend Dom and just seeing what he's done and, like, makes me want to become that much better myself, so. Nice. Yeah, that's, um, I think that it's good to have someone to kind of model yourself after in online poker. Uh, mm -hmm. even in just poker in general, because um, I had a, I read a Tommy Angelo's book a while ago, Elements of Poker, I think, and he talks about like modeling yourself after what you think a perfect poker player would look like. And so mm -hmm. like everyone kind of has that person that they know that in their life where there's just like, damn, I just, that guy does everything right. Like I want to mm -hmm. kind of emulate that. Um, you mentioned uh, you're a big fan of like the World Series of Poker and stuff. Um, is there any opportunities for you to play the World Series of Poker online? I don't know if yeah. uh, Michigan has yeah, that. So Michigan, yeah, in Michigan, they just launched the third state regulated site, so it was WSOP. They had WSOP bracelet events, I think. Like, I could have only played one weekend anyways, and I ended up not playing it. So I think the allure of the WSOP, for me, a lot of it is, like, the in-person events. Um, so as far as, like, being out there in Vegas. So I think I've been to the World Series three times. Okay. Um, and like it's you know super exciting to me i just i love the atmosphere i'm sure as you know like poker is such a niche hobby you know yeah. like people understand it but like not many people love it like we do and then when you get out to vegas at the world series it's like oh my gosh there's other people like me and i think that was always the coolest thing <laughs> yeah um, lots of the world series so it's a lot of like the in-person stuff of like you know not just like chasing the bracelets or whatever but just kind of seeing like how big poker really is you know and you know it feels like it's so small sometimes but it's just like insane the Rio, this year they switched it to Ballets in Paris, but it's still the same thing where it's like there's all these rooms of people, like thousands of people playing the same game that you do. Um, so I think like that's always been like the big thing. And then just, like, you know, watching TV coverage over the years has been like super cool as well. So it was like cool to follow along with WSOP, watch the main event on TV. And then even though I'm not playing like the main event, it's cool to be in like the smaller bracelet events or like just walking around and seeing those people you've seen on TV or just like seeing the same setup, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was huge for me too when I first started going to the World Series. I uh, I was initially an online player before I even played live, so 
um, I was a fan of World Series as well. And when I first went to the World Series, I think in 2010, I was like, oh, my God, this place is huge. Like when it was in the Rio. Uh, did you ever go to it when it was in the Rio? Yeah, I went twice at the Rio. So, yeah, I've seen all like the Amazon room and, you know, yeah. the pavilion and all that. You just walk in and you hear like everyone shuffling their chips and, you know, you hear the dealers saying like bet raise, whatever. And it's just like, you're like, oh, my God, I feel like I'm home. You know, like you feel like you finally found uh, where you fit in in life. And uh, that was that was a fun experience for me as well. I think that if anyone is a poker fan, they kind of have to go to the World Series at least once in their life just to get an idea of, you know, what it looks like. Um, and then contrasting on that, you have online poker series, right? Like you have the W Coop, the Scoop, you have the GG has things, um, ACR has tournaments. Everyone is, has a tournament series this now. It, it started off with like it was maybe Poker Stars and Full Tilt. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, maybe some of the other sites were a little smaller, but those were the main ones where you either wanted to win an F tops or you wanted to win a scoop or a W coop. Those were like the, the majors. And now it's like, well, you can win a world series of poker bracelet too on online. Do you feel like that kind of takes away from that world series of poker, uh, prestige or adds to it or. Yeah, I think it, it's kind of indifferent to me. I think that, you know, I kind of view like the live bracelets as one thing as the online bracelets as another. Um, again, just like with WSOP, I always think of live. But I mean, I think anytime you get opportunities to do stuff like that, it's super cool. Uh, play for a bracelet from home in Michigan. Never thought you'd say that. Uh, so I think it's cool, but I think it's just like it's an add on. I wouldn't say it's like equal to the lot. Like if you had to ask me, like the dollar amount would never be the same because like Michigan only want to be smaller, but like hypothetically if it's like hey you win 150 or 200,000 for winning this tournament one's live one's online like i would think i would take the live opportunity every time right. uh, as far as, so i think it's just like an addition to it but i do kind of view them as like a little bit different okay so do you what would you say then going forward is kind of your goal in poker like you've you've kind of established yourself now as being um a mid stakes grinder i know you mentioned that you were taking some shots at 510 which, uh, you know, is always a challenge when you're moving up in stakes, um, especially being disciplined to be able to move back down or to grind a different stake. Uh, so first off, like, how's how's your progression going with online poker? And what would you say, like, your your goals are right now with online poker? Yeah, so recently I tried taking a 510 shot. Unfortunately, it didn't go super great. And it was weird because it was um, in the Michigan sites, we don't have, like, tons of games going. So a lot of times I'm playing multiple stake levels at the same time. So I think I only lost like 3.5 buy-ins at 510, which we all know could be a 20 minutes in a session. Yeah. But uh, it was just like I got destroyed at 500 at the same time. So again, kind of back to that discipline of like, I'm a huge bankroll net. So it's like, if I'm even a dollar below, like I'm dropping. <laughs> so, um, you know, like unfortunately that shot didn't go well, but you know, I'm really like, proud of myself of like trying to push myself further and further. I think, you know, back to the competitive thing is like, I don't want to just be content playing the games I'm in. Even if it's like a higher level of playing 200 and 500 online than I would have ever expected to be at two years ago. Like now that I'm here, I just want to continue getting better. And then, you know, as far as the streaming stuff, it's just like to continue growing the stream. Um, I, I absolutely love streaming. I love doing the content stuff. It's just like become so awesome that this is like what I get to do on a day to day basis. Um, so, you know, and again, kind of going back to even though like a lot of times I might say my biggest goals are stream specific, where it's like growing the channel, try to get sponsorships, stuff like that. Um, I would say the biggest thing is like at the end of the day, I'm still competitive when I'm on the tables. I don't want to just be there and people watching. Like I want to be there to win. Uh, so I would say, you know, continue to rise to the stakes. I used to be huge on like I wanted to win a live tournament so bad, which we all know is like the worst goal you can ever come up with because it's so results oriented. But I would say now it's definitely transitioned to like try to get into 510, be able to stick there consistently and just grow in the stakes and just become a better and better player. Yeah. That's great. So like um, for the Michigan games, do you see like there's a, a cap or a ceiling that you could hit or? So I think in the immediate there probably is. Uh, so like, especially during daytime, it's not even like 510 runs very often at night. You'll have maybe a table or two from what I understand. I play a lot of daytime games. Uh, but then like, you know, the 510 and 1020 that's running, it can be three and four handed. And there's definitely a lot of ability to make money if you're one of the top regs in the pool, right? But it's still super competitive. Like there's only one 510 game going. It's like, you're going to be playing with probably four of the top players plus one weaker player or something like that. Right. Um, so it's like kind of like you got to get into that threshold of like trying to get into the top reg category. So I would say that's definitely a goal of mine. I'm definitely not in that right now. I'm kind of in the like winning reg category. Like I've had results that are good, but I'm definitely not like that top group of people. 
So I would like to get better and better. And I think with like in Michigan right now specifically, the huge opportunity isn't necessarily in this moment, but it's like if more states get reg- like um, passing online poker. So like when we first got online poker, the first six to 12 months, it's like the games are incredible, right? It's like I'm infinitely better than I was then, but my win rate's only slightly higher than it used to be because the games obviously get tougher after an initial run. Right. Um, so, you know, it, that's promising to see is like the fact that the games are much tougher than they used to be. My win rate's higher than it was last year. So it tells me that I'm improving. You know, obviously there's variance is even in cash games and stuff when you're putting in lots of hands. But um, I think that the potential really is like there's talk of the interstate compact in the U.S. where it's all these states get combined into one pool. So initially it could be tougher, particularly if we combine with a state called New Jersey. I don't know how many people are familiar, just a state in the U.S. Uh, that could be tougher at first, who knows? But if we start getting like, just to name random states, California, Texas, they launch online poker. And as soon as they launch, they're in the same player pool as us. Yeah. I mean, it's like sky's the limit, basically, as far as like higher games running, better games, and just kind of preparing for that moment and just being ready to kind of hopefully capitalize in that situation. Yeah, I love that sentiment because I think that's that's what I'm kind of, my mind's at too. Um, obviously, I'm in Canada right now because when Black Friday happened, I wasn't even able to play any of the games that I was normally playing already because mixed games weren't on any of the American sites anyway. They were only on the the Poker Stars, the Full Tilt Poker uh, sites. So I literally couldn't even access the games that I could play. I didn't even have the option. Um, but now, you know, having been outside of the States for so long, uh, now I'm settled down in Canada. Uh, I'm thinking like, oh man, like when's, you know, online poker going to come back in the U.S.? Like when can we have this second boom? Uh, because that's naturally when it would happen, right? When all of these states start linking up again, you get California, even if you just get California, I feel like that would be huge um for increasing the player pool so i would i would hope that we have i'm I'm pretty bullish on you know there being another boom online poker in america coming back the ability to play high stakes again kind of sneaking back into it you know before because before black friday a lot of people forget there was like 100 200 no limit hold'em games going pretty regularly you know, you had like 25, 50, 10, 20, 100, 200. And these games sometimes were even really good. So like the fact that uh, the rest of the world games now are like kind of capping at 2, 5 and 5, 10 is, is pretty bad. It's like compared to what we had before, I'm really hopeful that it'll return to that if America can start really getting into this, um, you know, legalizing poker uh, trend and continue with each state coming in and then maybe I'll have to actually move back to the US to play <laughs> online poker which would be really weird um, after being kind of forced to move initially is that something you've ever thought about like moving outside of the country to uh, access more games or higher games in the future yeah. yeah so I guess like first I just touch on exactly what you said I think that there's so much potential in the US market and like a huge reason why I was like willing to kind of go full time and take the shot here is like I think the long term things have to play out they're not guaranteed to to get all these states in but if they do it's like you're looking at a potential gold mine I'd have to imagine right. um, not to oversell it but I really do think it's just like crazy opportunity for a few years and poker's still huge in the US it's just all live so they're breaking records constantly for like live tournament entries. Cash games are running all over the place. These YouTube bloggers that play live cash games get massive viewings. I mean, it's just yeah. like it's poker still popular here. It's just live. Um, right. But I think it transition into the online. Um, and then as far as like me moving, I never really crossed my mind. And, you know, especially like I'm really content with where I live. I live in mid Michigan. A lot of my friends are here. My girlfriend lives here. I don't really see a reason that I would want to move. Um, and then also just from like, even if you're just looking at it from a game perspective, it wouldn't make any sense because again, I'm kind of just going off what people tell me, but the Michigan games at similar stake levels are softer than say playing on like .com sites. So like, it wouldn't really make sense for me to travel and play tougher games and uproot things where there's still enough action as is. And I expect the action just to get more and hopefully better in the future too. So kind of both lifestyle wise and poker wise it wouldn't make sense really to but i mean there's obviously the appeal of like hey i could play these like super high tournament buy-ins with huge guarantees but i think like logistically and realistically it wouldn't make much sense yeah yeah that's that's kind of where i'm at too all right um to wrap things up let's uh let's ask one last question we have from uh chip edge uk he says i know you have just been really getting serious about it in 2020 but 
Uh, what would David do differently if he could go back in time and start his poker career today? Yeah, so I think starting off, I would definitely just like focus on probably cash games. I think that like I really enjoy both formats, but you know, like there's obviously lower variance with cash games and just like really kind of be more efficient with my studying. So I used to be when I was like, for example, using tournaments, I would watch a lot of live streams, which is fun entertainment um, with whole cards and stuff. But like, I would rather spend those hours like I would still watch those for entertainment, but like my real study would probably be uh, getting joining a training site, going through hands. Um, I'm not sure if like coaching necessarily, but something along those lines of like basically making my study time more efficient, I think would be the biggest thing and would have like a more rapid growth for kind of like improving my game. Right. Yeah, that's kind of, I think, the sentiment of most people. You know, they see, like, what is the expert poker player doing? They're working with solvers. They're, you know, promoting courses and doing this and that. So I think that's uh, generally what most of us would probably want to get back into doing instead of goofing off. Uh, for me personally, playing Raz poker and stud poker, I don't know what I was thinking. But uh, <laughs> it led me down an interesting path, at least. All right. Well, um, thank you really very much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. I think um, it was really cool to see, you know, your background and kind of your perspective of things. Um, just as an online poker player, as a content creator, uh, if you'd like to plug anything, uh, where can people find you on YouTube or Twitch? Yeah. So thanks, Captain Prime CG. Really appreciate it. Had a blast talking with you. Like I said, big fan of your stream and uh, really enjoy watching your stream when I get a chance to. Uh, so as far as my stuff, I stream on Twitch as well. David K Poker, all one word, K spelled out, K A Y E. Uh, same thing on YouTube, and then I also have Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all the same name. I try to keep it nice and simple. So, uh, so yep, yeah, same name all across. All right. So if any of you guys want to go check out David K, please go check out all of his socials and uh, platforms. Thank you very much, Michigan Ivy, for coming on to the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I will see you on Twitch. I'm sure I'm going to give you some more raids in the future, as well as hopefully some more collaborations. Yep, sounds great. Thanks again, CG. All right, thank you.